it is an honor to uh, follow in the footsteps of some of the past speakers of this conference. An honor and I frankly a little intimidating. Um, as I read through the roster of people who have been part of this event, luminaries like Annie Leibowitz, and Molly Ivins, Henry Kissinger, David Crosby, Yishak Rabin, Ariana Huffington, Samuel Huntington, Studs Turkle, Ted Turner, Roger Ebert, to name a few. Um, in fact, I think it would make for some pretty in interesting dinner table conversation. Uh, but to borrow a phrase from former President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the conference may be the most extraordinary collection of talent and human knowledge since Ellen Roosevelt dined alone. <laughs> and in fact, I'm told that Ellen Roosevelt herself was a speaker. So I know Roger Ebert named this conference the Conference on Everything Conceivable. Uh, but I hope you'll forgive me if I narrow down my topics, uh, at least for a bit, to just focus on the world. <laughs> Today I want to talk just a little bit uh, about a topic that uh, is near and dear to my heart, which is the globalization of health as some people would call it in the United States, soft diplomacy. I like to call it smart diplomacy. So Tom Friedman speaks about globalization as having come in three stages. He says globalization 1.0 began around 1492, when the world went from large to medium. Then globalization 2.0 came with the world moving from medium to small, and at the turn of the millennium, globalization 3.0 came about, and the world went from small to tiny. And I would suggest it's growing tinier still. Now, all of this was illustrated to me very vividly um, in April of 2009, when I came to Washington uh, to be sworn in as Secretary of Health and Human Services. We had a well-planned out <coughs> succession event in Kansas. The Senate was going to take up my nomination early the morning of the 28th, and assuming that they would confirm me, my plan was to resign as governor of Kansas, swear in the lieutenant governor, come with my husband and family to Washington, get sworn in, and start my new job. Um, unfortunately, that's not quite what happened. I got a call early in the morning saying the Senate debate had begun, but there was a plane in the air, and President Obama needed me on that plane at noon. And when I reminded the caller that I was not sworn in yet and confirmed yet, he said, I understand, but the President wants you on the plane. Um, needless to say, that disrupted a few plans at home, and it also um, made me file a bit of a contingency plan, which was to leave a note literally on my desk in the governor's office and said, in the event I am confirmed, I hereby resign. <laughs> I didn't want to give up one gig before I really knew I had the next one. Um, so we were in the sky uh, somewhere over Ohio or Pennsylvania. I was so low at the time because I had scrambled and had no idea you know, what exactly was going to happen. And a uh, call came through saying, Madam Secretary, you have been confirmed. When we landed, there was a car waiting for me, and I said, where are we going? And they said, well, you're going to the Oval Office. You're going to be sworn in. At this point, it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, little uh, trivia note. It turns out that the president can't swear anybody in. He didn't know that. I didn't know that. He could hold the Bible. The secretary of the cabinet could swear you in. He did not have that authority. But I got sworn in and immediately got whisked off to the Situation Room because we were in the midst of an outbreak of what was known at that point as the flu virus strain H1N1. Uh, it became commonly known as the swine flu. Uh, but it was already becoming a worldwide crisis because it was the first flu virus in a very long time which was killing people, killing particularly young people fairly rapidly. There was no vaccine, there was no identification, nobody knew how fast it would spread. 
But what was very clear from the onset is that the United States could not tackle the situation alone. The virus at that point was thought to have started in Mexico and now was presenting across the country. So the situation briefing room that night included officials from both countries trying to share ideas and figure out what was going on. And after that briefing broke up and I went then to the department for the first time the next day, my first call in the office was not from a colleague, a former governor, saying congratulations, or from a member of the House or the Senate. It was from Dr. Margaret Chan, who is the head of the World Health Organization, welcoming me on the job, but also saying we have a crisis on our hands in what became the first identified pandemic in 40 years. So the dual reality of a tiny planet uh, became very clear to me very quickly. Crises, outbreaks, emergencies, uh, those are situations that don't recognize or stop with national values. And yet, neither does our capacity to counter them. 